A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in Kevin. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut in Lusa. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little, it is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide, you Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Jewish History Soundbites, and this episode about part one about Shemitah, Shemitah observance in modern times, has been generously sponsored by David and Toby Friedman in memory of their parents, Yaakov David and Retzabela Bajnan, and Arye Leib and Malia Friedman. And also in memory of the brave founders of Maskeret Batya Ekron, who were Maisrei Nefesh for Shemiras Hashmita during the first Aliyah. And uh, it's a great topic, uh, uh, Shemitah observance in modern Jewish history. And now we commenced recently the Shemitah year, so it's a very appropriate and uh, time-worthy topic to trace some of the highlights of the history uh, in modern times about how it came about with the original agricultural colonies and the different disputes about how to observe Shemitah during um, modern times. So um, we're going to try to take it through in several episodes. Um, You know, it all became relevant again after a long time that this uh, idea of observing Shemitah was dormant. And all of a sudden, with the renewed settlement and Jewish agricultural settlement that began in the last couple of centuries, so it became relevant again, and it's really an interesting and, 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 uh, and, and even contemporary uh, saga. So it's going to be in several parts, and sponsorships are still available for some of the later parts of the series. And before I begin discussing Shemitah, I'd like to just uh, discuss uh, some feedback from recent episodes, as well as some current events, history and current events, obviously. First of all, I mentioned... Um, I had the last episode on Rebbeftali Trups, I mentioned something in passing because it was before or around the time of Rosh Hashanah, it was right after Rosh Hashanah, right before Yom Kippur, and I mentioned uh, about the Piyot uh, Melech Elyon, and I discussed how there was a half of the Piyot which is gone, the Melech Elyon, most of that half is gone, we only say one or two stanzas of that, um, and, uh, and how in the original Machzairim, it did appear, the other half of Melech Evin, and how it was self-censored out uh, because of uh, fear of offending the ruling monarchs in the medieval times. So I, I mentioned that, and I wanted to mention this as a follow-up. It would have been more appropriate to mention it in an episode prior to Yom Kippur, but of course I didn't have time to record an episode prior to Yom Kippur. I'm always amazed, actually, at some of the other popular podcasts out there who record weeks in advance and have like 10 to 15 episodes sitting there in their archives ready to post at any given time at their leisure. And I'm always running at the last second. One day I'll have uh, some lessons. Uh, I'll, have, I'll have these other podcasters out there teach me the secrets of professionalism. And in the meantime, I guess I'll have to be comfortable remaining incompetent. Either way, I get this message after the, that most recent episode from a good friend and dedicated and very knowledgeable listener of Jewish History Soundbites, Rabbi Mordechai Kamenetsky, who related that he witnessed this story, this interaction with his illustrious grandfather, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. Someone approached him and asked him why we end each stanza of the piyot, Lade Adim Leich Melech Elyon. When in reality, the words Melech Elyon belong to the next paragraph, and really we should end Lade Ad Yimlech. And Melech Elyon is really the opening 
phrase of the coming paragraph. So how come we say it as one sentence? And he answered, Rabbi Yaakov answered on the spot that the letters, the acrostic, the the uh, the letter that opens each paragraph, each stanza of Melech Elyon, they skip a letter in the acrostic because really, originally it was supposed to be Melech Evyon is the interdispersed each paragraph between each one, and that has the other letter, the the even letters or the odd letters, whatever it is. It was inserted in each one, in between. So when they knocked it out, when they censored it out, so the congregants did not know that they were supposed to say, that they were not supposed to say, rather, the Melech Evyon parts. So the Chazan would say, La de ad yimleich Melech Elyon. Quickly he would say, Melech Elyon, jump to the next one to seamlessly lead them into the next Melech Elyon and to skip the Melech Evyon half. And Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky answered like that on the spot, not having researched the manuscripts that I was citing on the last episode. In other words, Rabbi Yaakov was able to suppose this entire reality and hit the nail on the head. He figured out the whole thing in his head instantly. So that's an absolutely incredible story about Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky, how he just intuitively figured out that whole uh, uh, issue. I want to just mention that... Um, um, Davi Safir and I have a fantastic article waiting for you in the Sukkot edition of the Mishpacha magazine about profiling Rebbe Malin and his story in Mir Yeshiva and in the escape to Shanghai and his building Beis Talmud after the war in New York. It's a great, great profile of Rebbe Malin. You don't want to miss it. So get your Mishpacha magazine if you haven't yet already. If you're one of those few people in the world who haven't gotten it yet. You may want to read it. We also have, of course, an extended for the record, uh, which is also very interesting about uh, um, different uh, Torah institutions who corresponded with the White House and tried to get them to send letters for their annual dinners and a whole story about that as well, the Eisenhower White House especially. So we move on. Before we get to Shemitah, finally, so there's one last thing. I just in the, saw in the news just a couple of days ago that Ida... Nudel, the recent passing of this very famous Refusnik, she passed away at the age of 90 uh, just a couple of days ago, um, prisoner of Zion legend. She um, she was an amazing woman. Um, unlike many other Refusniks, she was born pre-war. She, she came from, you know, she wasn't a product of post-war like some of the other uh, more famous ones, Yosef Mendelevich and uh, Anatoly Sharansky and others. Uh, so she was born in 1931. Uh, her father was 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 a soldier in the Red Army during World War II. He was actually killed in Stalingrad in the Battle of Stalingrad, unfortunately. So she was an orphan, um, and uh, she became an economist and later a refusenik. She wanted to move to Israel, and she was a pioneer in the refusenik movement, a leader also. She was a refusing for almost 17 years, longer than almost anyone else, and very instrumental in assisting other refuseniks. Uh, she was referred to as a mama, as an angel of mercy, um, and she would try to fundraise and try to. She found out which materials are allowed to be sent to um, to, to jail, uh, chocolate and, and, and undergarments and all kinds of other things. And she had that list, and she was able to ask people in the diaspora to send those those things so that. They can at least be uh, be, be uh, sent, had some have some basic materials uh, for the prisoners who are languishing in KGB jails and in Siberia and the Gulag um, for wanting to leave for wanting to leave the Soviet Union. At one point, she hung a sign from her Moscow apartment: "KGB, give me my visa to Israel," which is absolutely astounding in the context of the 1970s to have the guts to be able to do that. She eventually serves for four years in prison in the, in the, in the Siberian Gulag, and then she's denied uh, residence in Moscow. She's not allowed to return to Moscow afterwards, so she eventually had to settle in Moldova, out there and down south, um, and before she's finally allowed to emigrate in 1987. She had all kinds of celebrities come to her cause. Jane Fonda famously was one of the ones who took up her cause in a very serious way. Another celebrity in a different way, Mordechai Ben David, mentions her on his uh, Let My People song, uh, Let My People Go song, uh, Nadell and Sharansky and so many more, um, in that lyric. She was literally the face and a symbol of the entire Refusnik uh, movement and the plight of uh, a Soviet jury. So, 
That's um, another piece of history. So we're going to go to Shemitah now, about time, 10 minutes into this episode. Um, so the um, we're going to have a whole Shemitah series. Like I said, sponsorships are available. Please be in touch with me if you'd like to sponsor one of the installments of this series. There's an important disclaimer. You know, the, the Shemitah involves a serious halachic discussion. I don't know any halacha, unfortunately. It's not my expertise. Um, you know, if you want to consult your competent halachic authority to find out the halachic side of the issue, I'm sure they'll be happy to share it with you. Um, I'm not the address for that. Uh, so there is no halacha involved whatsoever. I'm just going to touch on what different rabbis said, but not in a halachic context, but rather a historical one. So don't hold me to any halachic opinion or or, or taking any position, please. Uh, um, you know, I just want to make sure that that's clear from the outset. I also don't have any ideological or political uh, uh, agenda here, so I'm going to try to steer clear of of that as well, or any contemporary fundraising issue. I'm just trying to trace the history as a good and very important narrative, an interesting one, I hope, as well. So part one is the beginning of Shemitah observance in modern times, and uh, we're going to talk about the first Aliyah, and uh, Ekron Maskeret Batya, which is the central story of, of, of the Shemitah observance in 1889, which is the topic of today. Um, later on in the series, we could talk about um, the, the development of the Heter Mechira, of selling the land to non-Jew during the year of Shemitah, and the dispute between Rav Kook and the Ridbaz in the early 1900s. And then later on, we have the Chazonish and the early Pailei Agodis Yisrael, uh, agricultural settlements. Um, and then you have um, its continuation into modern times. The founding of the State of Israel is a crucial time for the development of Shemitah observance and how that uh, changes the playing field. Um, and then and the further the Heter Mechira, and then Karen Hashvius, and the story of the Kaimim uh, um settlement, uh, Moshav, uh, later on in the, in the 1950s, and, and, and so on, which we'll get to in part three, four, five, six, hopefully. There's many, many sources out there on the development of Shemitah. There's books, there's articles uh, in Hebrew and English. There's quite a few good ones in Hebrew. Um, Rav Tikachinsky's book and others. Um, the best one in English on today's topic, by far the best, and it is definitely recommended. It's the definitive historical work on today's topic about Mazkeret Batya Ekron. Um, Sam Finkel's book, uh, uh, Rebels in the Holy Land, very long, but very, very, very good read. Um, lots of great footnotes and sources and pictures and appendix, appendices and and, and 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 the text itself and it's absolutely fantastic the research that he did is is is, is uh, you know unmatched in 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 this topic um, and for this story so he's the work on on today's topic uh, before the 1880s there was it was rarely relevant Shemitah observance almost was almost non-existent there were no uh, agricultural settlements there was very minimal Jewish settlement altogether in the Holy Land and almost zero agricultural activity by the Jewish residents, yet it did come up on rare occasions, and the idea of Heter Mechira was raised every couple of centuries, and it comes up in the halachic responsa as a possible solution, although because it was on such a minor scale, it seems that it was actually a real bona fide sale to a non-Jew, whereas the Jewish owner would leave the land and not do anything during Shemitah, uh, and, and then he would you know, buy it back after Shemitah was over. In those isolated, rare cases where the idea of Shemitah and Heter Mechira did come up over the centuries, that's what it seemed to be. But it never came up in a serious way until modern times. In 1861 was a Shemitah year, and it seems that there was some sort of minimal Shemitah observance in the old Yishuv of Yerushalayim, possibly in the outlying settlement of Motza. It's unclear. Uh, because it was being reported about in a different context a couple of years later in a letter from the old Yisha to the Elians, and they discussed, they just mentioned in passing that, that Shemitah was observed a couple of years prior. Two cycles later, in 1875, there was already the famous Mikve Yisrael Agricultural School, which is a legendary school founded and funded by the Elians uh, from France and uh, run by the legendary Karl Netter for many years until he passed away in the 1880s, which was a great blow to the uh, to the early uh, years of the of the of the first Aliyah, and uh, the Mikveh Israel Agricultural School was a modern agricultural school, and there 
It was going to be the real, you know, first time real Jewish settlement engaging in agriculture. And it, the story of the Mikveh Yisrael school and Karl Netter is a really a great story in itself for another time. But either way, Karl Netter apparently in the 1875 Shemitah year or coming up to the 1875 Shemitah year, he asks uh, Rabbi Leo Gutmacher, who's a prominent individual, also a great story and fascinating individual, kind of like a quasi-Hasidic Rebbe, um, and he asked him how Shemitah should be observed, and uh, it's unclear what he did, but it's possible, and it's likely that, that Mikveh Yisrael actually did observe Shemitah during 18, uh, the 1875 year, but still in its initial stages. Um, so, so again, it's it's very minimal, very minor. The first Aliyah begins in the 1880s, and I discussed the first Aliyah uh, in, in briefly in, in a recent episode, um, but here we have the first real colonies. Now, the colonists, for the most part, are religious, traditional Jews, who observe traditional Judaism. And they're primarily funded by Baron Edmund James de Rothschild, and um, others also, the Allianz funds them, and the Chove Tzion uh, movement uh, funds them, uh, but primarily Rothschild. So, 1882 is the first Shemitah after the, fir- after the colonies of the first Aliyah started, but it really still was not relevant because there were not that many colonies off the ground. It was just Petach Tikva, which was pre-first Aliyah. It was founded by the old Yishuv of Yerushalayim, uh, even before the first Aliyah got off the ground in, in 1878, which is also a great story. And of course, Mikveh Yisrael was still around. Motza, there seems to have been some sort of agricultural settlement, which is also related to the old Yishuv. So there was not really that many colonies of the first Aliyah yet that didn't really get off the ground. So 1882 is not such a great story about the Shemitah year either. What we really get to is the big story is the next Shemitah, in 1889. That's that's the story here. That's where there are already a significant amount of agricultural colonies of the first Aliyah. Zechron Yaakov, Rosh Pina, Rishon Litzion, Neis Tziona, and the previously mentioned ones, of course, Petach Tikva, and then, of course, the main ones, the topic, the main subject of our story here, Ekra, which later comes to be called, by then had already come to be called, Mazkeret Batya. Um, and then there's another one, another one which also plays a major role in the story, a separate role, uh, is Gadera. Gadera was a, a very unique story, which I'll get to, it was a, 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 uh, a settlement of of non-religious, irreligious uh, 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 settlers, the only one of the first Aliyah, pretty much, of Bilu, Bilu settlers, and ironically, they were also struggling to observe Shemitah without a Hatar Mechira, uh, while men, most of the religious ones were relying on the Hatar Mechira. That's also a good story. We'll get to that, hopefully, at the end. The focus is, of course, on Ekron, uh, which was uh, subsequently called Maskerid Batya. Um, so you have... Different people, different organizations involved in these first Aliyah colonies, the main one being Baron Edmund James de Rothschild, who, who is convinced by the leaders of Chovei Tzion, primarily Rabbi Shmuel Malhever, the uh, rabbi of Radom and the leader of the Chovei Tzion movement. Um, and uh, he funds the colonies, he gets them off the ground, he gets them to have the winery and engage in agriculture and invests and has his people uh, oversee the activities. And they... It's almost like a, you know, almost like a, a certain type, you know, you know, a very proactive colonization where the the contract, the relationship between there's this triangular relationship of the settlers themselves and Rothschild and Rothschild's staff, his managers, um, or the go-between, which becomes the crux of of the issue uh, in in the Ekron story, and um, and the the the. So that's one, one, he's the main player. There are two other players in the background, which is important to mention, the Allianz, uh, the Kiach, the Kol Yisrael Chaverim, the organization founded by French Jews in 1860, a very interesting and, and a great story also of an organization which was which was, saw the Jewish people as one, as a unit, unified Jewish entity, and, and sought to assist uh, the plight of Jews worldwide. It was the first organization of its kind in the modern era. And, uh, you know, French Jews who had already achieved emancipation, and their goal was to assist Jews worldwide who had who were still uh, who had not yet achieved freedom and emancipation and to start schools and education and, and all kinds of things like that. So Allianz was involved as a player as well. And, of course, the nascent Chavive Tzion, Lovers of Zion movement, um, of the of the, right now the 1880s, which was uh, becoming more and more 
a secularized leader was now already had shifted over from being the rabbinical leaders of the previous decade, or Shmuel Haver, and even Rabbi David, Rabbi David Karlin was involved for quite a few years. He even attended the 1884 uh, Katowice uh, Conference of the Lovers of Zion movement. But by now, it was people like Leon Pinsker and uh, Meshle Lillianblum and others who were so Sishkin and others who were. Uh, who were the uh, primary movers and shakers, leaders of the Chai movement. And they were the ones who send the colonists, and to a certain extent they even fund them, especially in the case of Gadera, where they were where they completely funded. It was solely funded by the Chai movement and not by Rothschild. So we'll get to that also. Um, Rothschild, like I said, has his people on site. In the case of Ekron, um, his, it was a fellow who was a notorious individual, who was not a, not a great person, who goes down in the history books as a... Not well liked, and he seems like he earned his his uh, his his reputation. He doesn't seem like he was a noble uh, of char- of noble character. Not only on religious issues, even on corruption and uh, and financial issues and management and administrative. It seems like he actually was not a great guy all, all around. His name was Alphonse Blach, and he was the one who oversaw uh, the colonies in the Ekron Maskarat Batya center of what was then Palestine area. And uh, the question arises in, in, in the historical context, was the issue more Blach or was the issue the Baron? Was the issue Rothschild? Um, and it seems to be that the issue was more Blach. Uh, the Baron seemed to have been more amicable to to hearing the settler's point of view of observing Shemitah, even though the Baron definitely, uh, at least according to the, the reports that he received, he responded quite harshly as well. So the 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 the, the, the negative and the belligerent somewhat response was from both was from both Bloch and the Baron, although uh, the Baron is actually receiving his information from Bloch. So again, it's hard to know. Um, uh, Ekron uh, it was really called the settlement. The agricultural settlement was really called Ekron. It was later named Maskeret Batya. Uh, the Baron's visit uh, there in the 1880s renamed it Maskeret Batya in memory of, of of Baron Rothschild's mother. Uh, Yechiel Brill, who was the famous uh, editor of the first religious uh, newspaper ever, is actually a fantastic book that recently came out about Yechiel Brill and the Halavanon 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 uh, newspaper, the first religious newspaper. Um, it's in Hebrew, but it's a great book. It really, you know, it goes into the the kishkes of of what uh, what, what religious journalism was, and Yaakov Lifshitz and Yechiel Brill and all that. Um, so either way, Yechiel Brill was a prominent activist, and he recruits Jewish farmer peasants from the Russian Pale of Settlement town of Novopavlovka, 11 family heads, the most prominent of whom was Chaim Moshe Press. Uh, but all of them were real pioneers, all of them really real heroes, really courageous. And, you know, we still know their names, and uh, unfortunately most of them are not well known, but these people really were the, the, the pioneers. Um, and most interestingly, and... What's often overlooked about this pioneering farming settlement of the first Aliyah was that they were very religious. Uh, Chaim Moshe Press was the intellectual of the group. He was literate and was able to, the one who was to maintain the correspondence between the different uh, players in this story. He was the go between between the uh, Baron's officials and the members of Maskeret Batya. And he was also the emissary of the settlement to to go to Europe to, to speak to the rabbinical leaders and and, and raise awareness uh, and explain their position on Shemitah during that whole uh, dispute and controversy. In addition, Press was the sole member of Ekron and quite a, rarity, a rarity of the first Aliyah altogether to see the birth of the State of Israel, to live long enough to see the birth of the State of Israel. He lived until the age of 104, passed away in 1948, a few months after the founding of the state. So that's also an interesting tidbit about Press himself. Um, the Russian settlers were soon joined by their families, and then they were followed by another smaller group from Romania, who were also religious. So the, with, by the arrival of the fateful 1889 Shemitah year, it was a growing and somewhat flourishing agricultural colony. Um, and they revolt against the, the baron and the baron's officials um, because of the Shemitah and, and, and what he wanted to, wanted to do, to keep them to keep on working the fields, using the, utilizing the Heter Mechira, which was obtained, which I'll discuss in a minute. Um, and uh, now, in general, you have to understand more context here, is that the relationship, the financial relationship between the Baron and the colonists on all his colonies, and there were other revolts 
in that relationship as well. Rishon Lutzian, for instance, not related to Shemitah at all, because in some instance, it's unclear if it was because of the Baron himself, or again, because of his officials on the ground, but these people were somewhat treated like serfs, uh, uh, working the Baron's fields. In other words, it, was, it wasn't clear what who the owner of the property was. Was it the Baron's, and these people were simply employees of him, who were allowed to work the fields? Were they renting? Were they leasing? Were they buying it from him, and he was just loaning them the money? Was he an investor, and he got shares? Was it was it just charity? It wasn't very clear, and 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 because of that, the you know the contracts were written were very often detrimental to the colonists, and 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 their their profits from it, it when when there was profitable years of the farming, and this caused problems in all the the barons' colonies, uh, not related to Shemitah. So that has to be kept in the background, also because that of course is going to play a role in these relationships. So. The Baron and his officials accuse the 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 residents of that they're lazy. Uh, they don't want to work hard at farming. They're aligning themselves with the rabbis of the old Yishuv who are telling them not to work on Shemitah, and they want to return to the Haluka system. And the whole idea of the first Aliyah is to distance themselves from the old Yishuv and that we're going to work the land and be productive and uh, and not be reliant on Haluka on handouts on charity. And here you are, a couple of years into your farming experiment, and now you want to go back to Chalukah. You don't want to work for a year. You want to just uh, rely on handouts. In fact, the rabbis of Yerushalayim, who encouraged them to abstain from work on Shemitah, because it was very problematic, as we'll see soon, to rely on the Heter Mechira, to selling the land in a in a in, in this in this sale to a non-Jew for the year of Shemitah, for the duration of that year. So the rabbis of Yerushalayim, the prominent rabbis, talking about great, great rabbis, the leaders of the Jewish people, Rabbi Shmuel Salant, and Rabbi Shua Leib Diskin were the most prominent, but it was a long, long list of rabbis who wrote this uh, proclamation called Kol Mehechal, and they promised to support this these farmers for abstaining from work during Shemitah, and they were going to raise money for it, and the Beis HaLevi, and the Netziv, and all the all kinds of great uh, Eastern European uh, rabbinical leaders attached their support uh, to their support of the farmers as well. There was a few more issues in the background here. One issue was very poor international communication. Okay, there's no telephones, there's no social media and WhatsApp, believe it or not. There's no telegrams even in the 1800s. Um, so everything is done by courier, by mail, uh, very, very, you know, poor communication. So until the Baron gets his information, it's not accurate, it takes a long time, and then he sends, he sends his response back, and by then things on the field have changed, and, 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 and you know, and, and because of that, these miscommunications happen. The second issue is the fact that the Baron himself and his officials and many leaders of the Chovei Tzion movement are secular. They're not religious. And this clashes with the worldview and the value system of the rabbis of Yerushalayim, of the rabbis of Eastern Europe, and of the settlers themselves who are very, very religious. And uh, therefore, that that's, that's, becomes a point of contention as well. The third issue is, like I mentioned already earlier, the Baron's officials are these go-between, and that exacerbates the situation because they're the voice of the baron, but not always are they expressing what what Rothschild actually wants. And they have some of the greatest rabbis of the day are involved because this is becoming a major issue, this revolt, and as the Shemitah year is coming closer and closer, and... uh, and Rabbi Shmuel Malhaver, as the leader of the Chayi movement, and Rabbi Mordechai Eliashberg, another leader of the movement, are asked to be involved and try to find a solution to the issue. And they did come up with the Heter Mechira, to be able to sell as an emergency measure, to be able to sell the land to a non-Jew. Uh, they solicit uh, the, uh, they want to get, you know, they want to get support for it. Uh, the, the, uh, the, so the third rabbinical leader of the Chayi movement at the time was the Nitziv, the Nitziv Alashin, and he refused. He did not support the Heter Mechir. He did not want to go along with it. So you have only two of them who are supporting it. Rav Shmuel Molhever, Molhever, Molhever and uh, Ramad Chael And they, um, they go, they want to get, they want to get uh, the, the, uh, the, the approval of Rabbi Tzachal Khan Inspector, who was the undisputed uh, Torah leader of the time. And this would, you know, give a lot more, uh, uh, it would resonate with people who would hear about it and it would, it would, it would seemingly be, be more acceptable once he supports it. So Rabbi Tzikol Hanan agreed to support the Heter Mechira, and later on also Rabbi Shua, uh, Trunk of Kutna, and Rabbi Shua Zenvil Klepfish, the, the Rav of Warsaw, and, uh, and they can sell it to non-Jews for the duration of the Shemitah year. 
But Reb Yitzhak Achonen then qualified this heter. Uh, he said two qualifications, which were crucial to this story. Number one, he said that the Bezdin of Yerushalayim, in other words, Reb Shmuel Salant, and to a certain extent, even Reb Shmuel Diskin, have to agree. And if they don't, then he retracts his support for the heter. And also the fact that the the uh, the the um, the Jewish workers should not work at all on the field. If they're selling the field, then it should only be non-Jewish workers uh, who are working the fields. Ooh, so that uh, changes things as well. Um, the other thing that, that made it also more problematic was that there was another leader of the Chayu Vetzian movement who was very supportive of the settlers and the whole First Aliyah, who had himself moved to the land of Israel during the First Aliyah, and that was Ramot Chagimpel Yafe of Rejani, the, the, the Rav of Rejani, and he had settled down in the land of Israel just a couple of years before. And he also was against the Heter Mechira, and, and he was the one who encouraged the settlers also to, to not rely on it. And that's in fact, brings us to the Gedera story also, because the uh, Chil Mechel Pinnas, who was the kind of the spiritual patron of the secular Bilu settlers in Gedera, he turned to Ramat Chagim for rabbinical uh, guidance. But let's get back to Ekron. So either way, the um, the uh, so the Yerushalayim rabbis did not give their support. They were against the Heter Mechira, Rav Shmuel Salat, Rav Shmuel Diskin. They uh, they refused to go along with it. Um, the there was another Bezdin Yerushalayim, which was you know just as prominent, if not even more prominent, was that was the Sephardic Bezdin of the Rab- Yerushalayim rabbis, and they did support the Heter Mechira, Rav Yaakov Shol Al Yashar. El Yashar, and her Rafael Meir Fanajil, they supported it. So you have the, the support of the Sephardic Bezdin of Yerushalayim, which was crucial, and that's what the, uh, the, uh, the, the colonies that did rely on it, they, they went along with that. Um, so most of the colonies did. Uh, Rishon Letzion, and Rosh Pina, and Zichon Yaakov, and other ones, they went along with it. Uh, some of the Petach Tikva farmers, not all of them, some of them went with the Heter Mechira, some of them did not. And the Petach Tikva farmers were originally from the old Yisha. And they, you know, they, they saw themselves as, 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 as going with the guidance of the Yerushalayim Ashkenazi rabbis. And, and, and all of the entire Mazkeret Batya, Ekron Mazkeret Yad, but the, all of them, they together as a group, they decided they're not going to rely on it at all. Um, and and this 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 uh, this becomes a, a major major issue, and the Baron, like I said, he accuses them of being lazy, and uh, and then they so then the rabbis Yerushalayim go out and try to get the support of other rabbis in Eastern Europe. In fact, the Svasemes of Ger, the Rabbi Leib Alter, the the great uh, Ger Rebbe, the Netziv, the Beis Halevi, uh, they they get this uh, thing going of trying to get the support for them for for keeping Shemitah. Um, and uh, and that and that becomes the the struggle throughout the Shemitah year um, of how they're going to manage to do it. And the Maskarid Batya farmers did manage to do it. Uh, so they, they 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 managed to you know get this uh, full full, uh, full rebellion, full revolt uh, in progress. Uh, and and this becomes um, this becomes the the. Um, the the story of of uh, because the press gets involved the Hamelitz uh, famous newspaper in Russia lambasts the farmers that they're lazy and they're going against the Baron and he's the great patron and what's going to be with the first Aliyah what's going to be with the colonies if we get the Baron angry and he's going to cut off his support and how can they do that and the newspaper Hatzvi of Yerushalayim of Eliezer ben Yehuda wrote very sharply against the farmers of Maskeret Batya about how they're returning to the ways of the old Yishuv of going Chalukah and and just want to rely on handouts and 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 and, and the and the and the, this becomes very tense and very highly uh, um, you know publicized especially when the Gedera settlement uh, which was uh, ironic again it's tremendous irony Bilu secular settlers but because they were supported by Chayv Etzien. And because Chayv Etzien's man on the ground was Zichil Michal Penis. And Zichil Michal Penis was very religious. And he guided them and encouraged them to keep Shemitah. So the, here you have most of the religious uh, colonies went with the Heter Mechira. The Ritzel Kachan Inspector supported it with all the qualifications at the end of the day. Right? And here you have the secular settlement, Gedera, which uh, was opposed to was going with it, with, with Penis's uh, encouragement and his leadership. Um, so, but they didn't lie. They held out only for a few months, and they were—they were, had nothing to do with the Baron. And this has nothing to do with Rothschild. This has to do with 
with um, with the Chayvetzian movement themselves, and Pinsker uh, got involved, and he wrote a very angry letter, and the Chay- and and then Itziv wrote him a letter, and you know had this whole correspondence back and forth. It becomes known as the Gadera controversy, um, and and they somehow managed to go through that first year of Shemitah. So. That's just in summary of that 1889 year of Shemitah. The long-term ramifications is this the beginning of the religious opposition to settlement. Uh, of, of, you know, this, until now, it's Chayvetzin is primarily a religious movement, religious settlers, religious farmers. And here, we, because of the whole Shemitah issue, and because of all the bitterness involved in the media and everything, so this becomes the beginning of religious opposition to, to settlements, to... To uh, to moving to the land of Israel, to agricultural settlement, to building these moshavot, uh, and this becomes the beginning of the friction between the secular and religious. What's interesting is that this is years before it was all before Herzl and political Zionism. So everything was in place. All the future issues of the secular and religious, all the future issues of of of, of religious opposition to Zionism, all happens before the Zionist movement even gets off the ground. And Shemitah becomes the catalyst, becomes the story of how that uh, friction begins, which becomes uh, continues to be a bone of contention in the issue in the coming decades, and in, to a certain extent even until this very day. So we're going to continue to explore it in the upcoming installments. So this is Yehuda Geber with Jewish History Soundbites. You can reach me at Yehuda at YehudaGeber.com for questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, sponsorships, and lectures. You can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on Podbean or your favorite podcast platform, and I hope you enjoyed.